Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see each of you here. If you happen to be visiting with us, we invite you to fill out a connect card in the back of the pew. And if you're watching online or going to view us later, you may connect with on the internet. There's a link there to connect to us, and we would appreciate that. We like to hear from all of you, especially our visitors. I, I want to highlight two announcements today. If you read your bulletins, it's cover to cover with announcements. But two that are very important is August the 14th, we are having a family fun night at Chickie's Park. We're going to need some help for that. So there's a sign up on the bulletin board out in the lobby to please sign up to either help set up, help tear down, hand out ice cream, just be there for encouragement for the other, other people that are going to become from the community. But we need some help for that. And then this October, we are starting a WANA club here on Wednesday nights. We're going to need some help for that. If you feel led to lead and to help teach children in the neighborhood, please come out and help us. Uh, we're gonna hear some more about that this morning as an announcement uh, here during church. And then we're gonna have a Sunday school uh, after church today. And Landy will be uh, te teaching us about Awana, I believe today. And you'll have your eyes open as to exactly what it is and how you can be involved and the excitement that should go along with just being an outreach to the community. Now, a couple weeks ago, our pastor had a wonderful sermon on prayer. And it was interesting that sometimes I hear comments like, oh, I can't pray. Or I don't know what to pray for. Or God's way up there and we're down here and really don't know how to talk to him anyway. And the pastor pointed out that prayer is just talking to God. So as we go to prayer today, I'd like you to imagine that when you go to prayer, you are ushered into the very presence of God. And when you bow your head and your heart before him, you're standing before Christ, sitting beside the Father in the heavenly throne room. Now, maybe you can't imagine that. Maybe that's difficult for you to imagine. But let me assure you, even if you aren't ushered into his presence, when you call on his name, he is ushered into your presence. He is right here in our midst. Even if we don't call him, he's right here in our midst. And that's important to understand because so many times when we pray, maybe we don't know exactly how to pray or what to pray for. So today, we're going to do something a little different. And you may not like it, but that's okay. This will be different. I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes open when we pray. I know you like to, some of you like to close them because you're supposed to go into your closet where no one can see you in, in your own privacy and everything. But today I want you to do something different. Keep your eyes open while we pray. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for being in our midst. When we think of you, we think, how can we approach you? But we don't have to approach you. You've already come to us. 2,000 years ago, you died on a cross to pave a way for us to know you. How can we overlook that? And we can, we can be sorrowful because of what you suffered, the brutality and the sorrow of that day. The weight of the sin of the world for all time was on you. Today, Father, though, instead of standing here just... Or, uh, Excuse me. Instead of standing here condemned, we are standing before you right now justified because there is an empty tomb somewhere that is looking for its owner, and he's not there. We serve a risen Savior. Yes, he was crucified, but he rose. And as we think about what to pray for, Father, and we sometimes get confused, help us to look around what you've created at the plants you've created, at the trees, the flowers, the insects, the bugs, the night sky. Father, you have created a world that is just wonder-filled and wonderful for us to enjoy. And you did all that before you even made us. Father, we thank you, thank you. For, the country, for the country we live in. We live in a country where we are here today without fear. We live in a country that was purchased and freedoms that were purchased 
by blood for our country and for our souls. As we look around or from, uh, to your left and to your right, we see many people here today. Father, we think of one who is going through surgery on Tuesday. Be with her. Be with us as we pray for her. Father, we look around, we see other folks who maybe have some financial issues and some problems. Be with them. Perhaps we can help them. We, we look and we see folks who have lost loved ones. Father, comfort them. We see some who have children that are just starting out. Father, give us the strength to be encouragers and helpers for those folks. We have folks up here, Steve and Bob and Nikki and the other Bob. And there's many more who come up here from day to day, week after week, faithfully to lead us in our worship. Father, help them to keep their eyes focused on you so that we might keep our eyes focused on you. What we say and do here is for an audience of one, our Lord Jesus Christ. We do nothing here for entertainment. It's just maybe not that entertaining. But Lord, what we do, we do from a heart of service, a humble heart. And yet we can be bold when we come to you. We don't have to be scared, although fear of the Lord is good, but not af afraid. We are just fearful because he is so awesome. Father, when we look around, we also see people who are standing in the back who help us with the sound, with uh, our online camera, with the videos, with so much technology that we have available to us today, which allows us to worship here, online, wherever you are, whenever you are looking. Thank you for those people who make it happen. I couldn't do it. And Father, we look and we, ha we have folks who are getting older here, and some of them maybe have trouble getting around. I pray that you'll be with each of them, strengthen them, encourage them, allow them to be of service to us through their prayers, because we need their prayers, and we thank you for their faithfulness. Father, we also think about our missionaries around the world and what they endure. And here we sit in our pews, and we wonder, why can't they do more? Why can't they reach more? Help us, Lord, to realize, as we learned in the past weeks, we are all missionaries. Wherever we live, wherever we go to school, wherever we work, wherever we walk in the neighborhoods, the missions are wide open, but the workers are so few. Help us to fill that gap, not in our strength, but in the strength of the one that lives inside of us, because he is greater than any strength that is in the world. We thank you, Father, for so many things so often. We cry out to you for so many things so often. And we maybe think, Father, do you ever get tired of listening to me? And your word comes back, a resounding no. Please call on my name. And so we do that this morning, Father, as we worship you. And may all that we say, all that we do, all that is said, all that is sung, may it bring honor and glory to you and to the name of your son, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our kids that are here today, which are very few, I think. So we're going to get our kids to come up and help me this morning. Um, I realized this week that a majority of our family, our family with kids are away on vacation today. So, um, yeah. and we got some visitors, yeah, great, good. So, and we have all girls today, and that's good. So, we're going to look at the screen in the back, and we've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit this summer, and so each week, we say the fruit together. Okay, come on up, another girl, yes, what a great Sunday, just girls today. So we're going to start, and we're going to say them together, ready, love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Very good, ladies. That was excellent. And so today, we're going to talk about gentleness. And gentleness means to respond to a person or situation in a tender and mild way, being calm and helping others to be calm. And then there's a verse, Proverbs 15.1. It says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. And so I was thinking about gentleness and something that we have to be gentle with. And it helps us to understand. And since we have girls today, I think this is really good. So I brought... Actually, I didn't bring this. Pastor Keith had this for me. <laughs> and so, what is this? A baby. A baby, a baby doll. A baby doll, right. So... A baby doll. So we're going to pretend like this is maybe a real baby. So, you know, as a man, I'm not really sure how to treat this. Is it okay to sort of go? No? It's not okay? Is it okay to go? Oh, no, I dropped the baby. No? That's not. Is that is that gentleness? Okay. Is it okay to just carry the baby around like this? That's not gentleness either? I don't even carry my toys like that. You don't even carry your toys like that. Okay. Well, maybe you girls, since we're talking about gentleness, and the next, there's another verse. Go ahead to the next slide. It says in Colossians 3.12 that we're to clothe ourselves with gentleness. So we're to be gentle. And so, again, I don't know if I understand gentleness. So as having girls... Can you maybe, maybe a couple of you, I'll start with you. Show me how, how should I, what would be gentle with, with her? Show me something. Oh, okay. Carrie, like that would be gentle? Can any of you else think of something? Oh, very good. Yes. Yeah. Don't drop her on the ground. Okay. Okay. I know we've used them. Don't carry her like this. <laughs> yeah. Don't carry her by the... Is it okay to carry her by the hand like this? That's not, is that gentle? No. So when I was thinking about gentleness, I thought the most gentle thing is a baby. But we're supposed to be gentle to each other, just like... We talked about being gentle to this baby. So is there any other ways that you can think that we, how we could be gentle to each other? Be nice to each other. Be nice to each other. Don't, don't try to hurt someone. Don't try to hurt someone. Say, kind words. Say kind words. Yeah. Is this kind? That's really an ugly sweater you have on today or sweatshirt. That's not nice. Yeah, that's not nice. It's, I, and it's really pretty. I like the colors. The pink and the blue. It's very girly looking. So, yeah. So, see, I was nice to her, wasn't I? Because I said nice things about her sweater. So, I want you ladies this week to practice being gentle. Just like we learned how to be gentle... With the baby doll, we need to be gentle in the way that we treat each other and the things that we say to each other. So help, thank you for helping me to learn about gentleness today. There are some papers there on gentleness, and there is some cookies or some fruit treats there for you. So go ahead. Thank you, ladies. Well, today we have a special guest with us, and uh, as Gary said, he'll be in Sunday school, so I want to encourage you to stay for Sunday school and learn about the Awana ministry. But we have our Awana missionary, and who's with us uh, as Awana missionary. He serves 
140 some churches now in uh, Pennsylvania, Western Maryland. And uh, so he has a big job to do in taking care of those churches and, and the clubs. And this fall, we're going to be starting Awana. And so he's going to be talking to you about that in Sunday school. But he's going to come now and share with you a little about the Awana ministry, Lanty Moss. Great to have you, Lanty. All right. All right. Well, it's good to be with you again. I was here a few weeks ago. Um, but what, you want, what I want to tell you today about Awana is this. We have a great opportunity, and you guys have a great opportunity, to meet a need that, that is really prevalent. Okay, I thought of a verse, and really to me, I think this, when I read this verse years ago, I thought this is the saddest verse I've read in the Bible. Okay, have you ever read sad verses in the Bible? Here's one that I, that I read. It's in, Ju- it's in Judges chapter 2. Verse 10, and it says, When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. You know what's sad about that? Two chapters before that, when Joshua was getting ready, Joshua was getting ready to pass away, he asked the whole nation of Israel, you know, are you going to stand with the Lord? And he said, some, he said they, the whole people said something that you guys probably have a plaque of it in your, in your house somewhere. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The whole nation said, we will serve the Lord. Two chapters later, we read this verse. That a whole generation passed and another generation arose who did not know the Lord nor the work that he had done. You know, that's really a prophetic verse if you think about it because... Doesn't that sound like us? Doesn't that sound like America today? We have another generation who's arising who does not even know the Lord and the work that he has done. You have a great opportunity through Awana and through ministries like this to do that very thing, to change the trajectory of a lot of these kids. Uh, And what's amazing, and I told the church when I first came and, and, and talked to the board and said, you know what, coming out of COVID, this is the greatest time probably ever to start a ministry like this. Because kids have not been able to get together. They've been, you know, cooped up at home. They've been, they want to get out. They want to get with other kids. They want to meet together. And you guys starting this ministry is going to be a great thing to do that. Um, and I just encourage you, if you haven't, if you haven't ever done it, I mean, please stay in, in, at, for Sunday school and we'll, we'll tell you a little bit more about it. But I'll tell you, anybody in this room can serve in Awana. Okay? And you sit here today and say, well, I don't even like kids. You know, you can still serve in Awana. I need people that don't like kids to be here because, you know, there's a lot of doors in this building. I need you to stand guard so nobody comes in, nobody leaves. Uh, there's going to be kids that come in that are kind of rowdy. We can say, you know what? Now, if anybody here named, anybody here named Chuck, anybody? Okay. All right, this is safe then. I'll say, you know what? If you're not, you don't behave, you've got to go talk to Mr. Chuck. You know, there's always somebody who's, you know, it's really foreboding, you know, that kind of thing. We will need people like that because there's going to be kids that come through our door when we invite the neighborhood in who comes. Everybody, because we want every kid in, the, in Mount Joy to come. Every kid that can, we want them to come through these doors. And when they come, they're going to bring their attitudes with them. They're going to bring their naughtiness with them. They're going to bring their language with them. They're going to bring all that stuff with them. So we got to be prepared for that, don't we? We want to show them the love of Christ. We want to show them that Jesus Christ died for them. That's our job. We want to do that. And you know what it requires of you? To love kids. But again, I said, you don't even have to do that, but it'd be really great. <laughs> All right? If you don't like kids, I don't want you teaching them, okay? We'll find another job for you. I'll have you guard the door. I'll have you do something. But we need you to love kids because you know what? That's going to make the difference. That's what's going to bring the kids back. But I'll tell you what. They're going to come because it's fun, but they're going to keep coming because somebody here cares about them. Because you know what? In the world out there, they don't really care about them anymore. I mean, even their families sometimes don't really pay attention to them. They're starving to death for somebody to give them that time, give them that, you know, sit down and care about them. So the best thing you can do for these kids in Mount Joy is to volunteer, and then the next best thing you can do is show up every week. Because, again, what has is, what is our world showed them that, you know what, they don't have somebody they can count on, that every week they're going to be there, So that's the two things that you guys can do. Everyone in this room, volunteer to help and then come every week. Because, again, that's going to mean the world to these kids. They're going to look back and see 
that they experienced something here at the Mount Joy Church of God that they didn't experience anywhere else in their life. And the Holy Spirit's going to connect the dots and say, that was because of Jesus. That's why they cared about you. That's why they came. That's why they shared their life with you. That's why they shared Jesus with you. So that's what I ask of each of you. I mean, if you, again, you've never done this before, it's a great ministry to be involved in because we, t- we give you all the things, the tools you need are right in front of you. The biggest tool you need, like I said, is to love kids and care about them and love them so much that you want to share Jesus Christ with them. And that's just the amazing thing about this ministry because kids are going to come because they're starving, like I said, for somebody to pay attention to them, somebody to share the love of Christ with them, somebody to uh, have fun with. And you guys are going to get to do all those things. But the best thing we're going to do, we're going to maybe turn around this verse in America where we don't have another generation arise who didn't know what Jesus Christ had done for them. Okay? That, again, like I said, it's the saddest verse I've read because that is happening to us just like it happened to the nation of Israel. And we don't want that to happen. We want to change that. And we can do that. You guys can be all be a part of that. And we can start it here. Start here in Mount Joy and go from the rest of the country. Because what happened in the, in the book of Acts, they started in Jerusalem, and, when, and it covered the whole world. It could start here, and we could take it wherever God wants it to go. So you guys be a part of this. Because when we look back on this years down the road, if, we, if the Lord tarries, we don't know what we could look back and say, man, look what the Lord did through this ministry of reaching these kids and bringing new families into our church and all those things. So thank you guys for, for coming and for letting me talk to you a little bit. And if you want to hear more, like I say, come to Sunday School. We're going to sing a medley, Majesty, and listen to all the wonderful words, Majesty, worship His Majesty. You know, that's what prayer is about. Prayer is worship. And when you start thinking about prayer, and Gary talks so much about it, we're worshiping when we pray. So let's stand now and just praise Him, Majesty Medley.
next song is Before the Throne of God Above. And it's a beautiful song. Pay attention to all the words. They're so important. Father, you have bowed down low to raise us up. We thank you. Because you've done all you could for us, it is only right that we do all we can for you. But we do it not in and of ourselves, but through you. We thank you and praise you for the working through us. Thank you and praise you for allowing us to come beside you. And thank you and praise you for being our God, for being our Savior and our Redeemer. And now, Lord, as we offer back to you all that is yours anyway, we would ask that you would use it to further your kingdom here and around the world. And we pray that as we offer our money, that we would also offer ourselves. For what is most valuable to you is what you died for, us. Thank you, Father, for your perfect love through Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, the children are dismissed to Children's Church. And then we're going to sing another hymn, Trust and Obey. The first three verses.
Amen. Thank you, Nikki, for ministering to music today. How many of you brought your Bibles? Did we do any better this week? Hold them up if you brought your Bibles or your phone. I said your phone counts. Yeah, grab your phone. Now, those who held your phone and don't have the Bible app, shame on you. <laughs> Just kidding. So remember last week I told you I wish I had a dollar to give everybody who brought their Bible? Remember that? Well, I had somebody come up to me and say, Pastor, I will give you dollar bills to give out. Now, I'm not telling you when I'm going to do that, but there will be a Sunday that I will give out dollar bills for everybody who brings their Bibles, because I believe in bribes. So, anything to get you to carry the Word of God and bring it to church. Um, so, I do think, I, I think... Carrying God's Word is important, whether it's on our phone. Uh, I usually, when I go to do a hospital visitation, a lot of times I'll just take my phone and use my Bible app. Uh, but I want to encourage you, when you come to church, bring your Bibles, open them up, and uh, mark them uh, on different things when God speaks to you. So think about it. If you don't know where your Bible is, go home, hunt it up, and put it by the front door so you'll bring it with you next week, okay? So if you have your Bibles... Or your phones, take them, open them to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Today we start a series for the month of August on David, a man after God's own heart. And all the five Sundays this month will be preaching on the life of David. And so this morning is called The Reluctant Hero. And we're going to end up this morning looking at Psalms 25, verses 1 through 5 at the end of our message. And I'm asking also for you not only to bring your Bibles, but for this month, I'm going to ask you to memorize Psalms 25, 1 through 5. As we go through the life of David, you will see that this is an important portion of Scripture that David, I believe, will end up coming back to often in his life. So, Psalms 25, 1 through 5, uh, try to work with me and memorize it. I'm not going to give you any money for memorizing, but I would encourage you to do that. The Bible says that we are to what? Hide God's word in our heart so that we might not sin against him. And one of the ways that we do that is through Bible memorization. So that's our challenge as a church this month to, re, uh, to memorize Psalms 25, 1 through 5. And so I have a question for you. What do you put your trust in? What do you put your trust in? And I think sometimes if we were honest, the right biblical answer would be what? The Sunday school answer, God, Jesus. I put my trust in Jesus. And of course we would all say that, but sometimes our lives don't reflect that. And I would even tell you maybe even sometimes my life doesn't reflect that I put my trust in God. And so we put our trust in a lot of different things. Sometimes people put their trust in money. We save it. We work hard to get it. We worry, will we have enough to retire? Will we worry, we worry that will we have a life that's comfortable? Will I have enough to leave to my kids? Uh, we think about all those things, and a lot of times we spend a lot of our life putting our trust in our money. Um, another one is position. Our position, we, you know, we put our trust in our position, maybe at work, and we, you know, all of a sudden that position is gone. I had a, one of my elders in New Jersey who was vice president of Subaru, uh, one of the, the places there in Jersey, and uh, because he would not lie, they fired him. It took him six months to find another job, and he had to relocate his wife and five children to Texas. But, I mean, he had a car. He had everything you could possibly think of as the vice president of Subaru. And because he wouldn't lie and he stood true on the word of God, just like that, that position was gone. We put our trust in relationships. And often, you know, those relationships end broken. Sometimes even within a marriage, we put our trust in our partner. And sometimes marriages end in divorce. We put our trust in our own self and our heart. I read this week in a Huffington Post magazine or an article online, it says, your heart wants only what's best for you. It is up to you to trust your beautiful heart 
because it, is ultimate, it ultimately means you're trusting yourself. What do you think about that? Nah, that's right. Because the Bible says my heart is desperately what? It's wicked. It is wicked. My heart often goes contrary to what God's Word says. So I can't put my trust in my heart. Or maybe some of you here today say, Well, Pastor, you're a pastor. We're putting our trust in you. Well, don't do that. I served wine last week at communion. <laughs> don't put your trust in me. For those who weren't here, you'll have to ask others about that. So don't put your trust in me. I, I will fail you. And you know, maybe you're putting your trust in your, in your parents, but the reality is even as parents, man, I've, there were times I failed my kids horribly and had to come and apologize to them. And so we put our trust in a lot of different things, don't we? And so this morning, we're going to find out where David put his trust. And so just a little bit of review. If you got the vineyard, and Heather does a great job with this, in the vineyard actually is an introduction to this series. So if you haven't read it yet, I would encourage you to uh, look at it and read it. You can pick up a copy in the back, or you can uh, look it onto your computer and, or on your phone and see Heather sent all these out. But in the article here, I gave you a little bit of history that takes you back into chapter 16, where Saul had been king, and he wasn't doing a really great job, and so God decided there need to be a new king. Now, reality is, Israel wanted a king. God never wanted them to have a king, but he gave them a king to show them, hey, you know, this is not really what you wanted. But he gave them a king, and Saul wasn't the best king. In fact, when you look at all the kings of Israel, there weren't too many that were really good when you study them. But when you go back to chapter 16, God was done with Saul. It upset Samuel, the prophet, and he was really heartbroken. And God said, listen, Samuel, get over it, and I want you to go, and I want you to anoint a new king. And so God sends Samuel on a mission, and uh, he sends him to Jesse's house. And uh, so Saul makes a mess, and now Samuel's on this mission. He goes to Jesse's house, and he tells him, Listen, God has sent me here to anoint one of your sons as king. And he sees the oldest son, and immediately Samuel thinks, Wow, he's the one. Look, he's a nice-looking guy. He would make a great king. He's, you know, tall. He's handsome. He's strong. He'll be a great king for Israel. And so he decides right away this is who he's going to pick. And God says, hold it, hold it, hold it. This is not the one. This is not the one. He, sa he reminds him, listen, we look on the outside, but where does God look? Inside. He looks on the heart. He looks at your heart. He said, this isn't the one. So the prophet Samuel says to Jesse, no, this isn't the one. So Jesse has six other sons. He prays them by him, each one. The prophet says, nope, 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 nope. And finally, he says, is that it? Don't you have any more? Jesse says, well, I do have a, another one, but he's out in the field watching the sheep. Now, I don't have time to go into it. You don't find this in the Bible, but if you study a lot of Jewish writings, you will find out that there's in the Jewish writings, a lot of Jewish historians believe that actually David was Jesse's son by another woman. And so David was rejected by his brothers and even by his father. That's why Jesse didn't even bring him. And again, a lot, if you study the Jewish writing and Jewish history, you'll find that out. So a lot of Jewish writers believe this is the reason that Jesse wasn't even going to present him because he didn't look on him very good. And also the brothers didn't like him either. But finally, he brings David, the shepherd, from the field, puts him before Samuel, and Samuel says, yep, this is the one that God wants me to anoint. And he anoints him and makes him to be king. Now, he won't take that position for almost 20 years he'll wait for that position to come. And we'll see that next week. 
But today, we're going to focus on chapter 17, and this is probably the story of David's life, other than his great sin with Bathsheba, that we know the best. And so he sort of is the, what I call the reluctant um, hero in this. So what's happening as we get to chapter 17 is the armies of the Philistines have gathered on one side of the hills, and then the armies of Israel have gathered on the other side, as it tells us in chapter 17, verse 1. It says in verse 2, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up a line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And so get this picture in your mind this morning. Here's this valley, the valley of Elah, and up on this mountain is the Israelites, and up on this mountain is the Philistines. And evidently, they believe, historians believe, that this battle had been going on for some time, that they would come down every day and they would fight each other. But to this point, there had been no victor. And in biblical times, what would happen if the war had been going on for a long period of time and you were losing lots of men, each army would choose one man to send out who would fight, and whoever won that, then that army would be the winner. And so... I believe this is what's happened, and this battle's been going on for some time, and so finally the Philistines decide to send their champion out. In verse 4, And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, about nine feet nine inches. So a pretty tall guy. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he, had a, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was about 5,000 shekels of bronze. And, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and a spearhead weighed about 600 shekels of iron. It's about 15 pounds. Just the spearhead itself was about 15 pounds. So you can imagine this spear. This was a mighty warrior. This was a champion of, of the Philistines. And uh, you see, and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted for the ranks of Israel. Why have you come out to draw up for the battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be your servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly what? Afraid. They were afraid. They saw this giant standing there every day now, coming down and yelling up, Hey, send someone out to fight me. Come on, what's wrong with you? Are you afraid of me? Send a man out to fight me. And so this evidently has been going on for days. The Israelites and, uh, were afraid. Saul was afraid himself. Saul was over seven feet tall himself. He should have been the one who went and fought, but he was afraid, so he didn't want to do it. And so this is the scene that happens. Now, back a little ways from that scene is David watching the sheep. And so his father comes to him in verse 12, and now David was the son of Ephraim of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse. Who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest of the sons, Jesse, had followed Saul to battle. So David's three oldest brothers, Jesse's three oldest sons, are at the battle. And you see that. And uh, so, go down to verse 17. And Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers an eff of this parched grain, these ten loaves, carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers, also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousands. See if your brothers are, as we are well and bring some token from them. So Jesse, the father, comes to David and says, I got a job for you. 
I want you to go down to the battlefield. I want you to check things out. I want you to take this bread. I want you to take this cheese. Cheese sandwiches. It sounds good, huh? And I want you to give, you know, find out what's going on down there. Haven't heard any news. You know, nothing's on the, the television. You know, CNN, Fox isn't there covering. Haven't heard anything. So I want you to bring me back some information. So what do you think David thought about this? Remember, he's probably somewhere between 16 and 19 years old at this time. He's been watching the sheep, and his dad says, I want you to go to the battlefield. What do you think? Oh, yeah, this is better than watching sheep, huh? Yeah, man, this is great. I get to drive the family chariot. And so as we study the scripture, we find out that David listens to his father. He does what his father tells him to do. It says in verse 19, Now Saul and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provision and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment of the host and was going out to, ba to the battle line shouting the cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up the, for the battle army against army. And David left the things, the charge of the keepers of the, um, of the baggage, and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And he talked with them. Behold, the champion of the Philistines, Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words before and as David heard him. And so here's what happens. David gets there first thing in the morning. The, the, the both armies have gathered again. And just like it had been happening for days now, this Goliath stands out and he starts with his morning speech. Come on, Israel, send somebody out to fight me. What's wrong with you? Are you afraid? Where's your God? He's not going to protect you. And so David arrives just at this moment. And it says in verse 24, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who came up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And again, you ought to underline that. Because here's this 16-year-old kid, somewhere between 16 and 19, and you know he, he sees what's happening, he sees everybody's afraid, and he says, Hey, don't you understand? This guy is defying our God. He's blasphemous towards our God. Aren't you going to do anything about this? Verse 28, the brothers. Now, Eli, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to them, and Eli's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done? So, what is, what is not but a word? And he turned away from him towards another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again before him. And I love the brother's reactions. Because David speaks up and he wants to take a stand for their God and immediately his brothers get what? Get irritated. They get angry at him. Who's watching the sheep? Why are you down here anyway? And again, that goes a little bit to the history of the family that the Jewish historians have wrote about, the feelings that the brothers have towards David. And so, you know, what, what are you doing? Why are you saying these things? And immediately David's just, what have I done? I've just come to bring you some sandwiches and find out what's going on that's why dad sent me but the brothers are really ticked off at him verse 31 when the words that david spoke were heard they repeated them before saul and he sent for him and so now david is going to come before saul because saul's heard that this guy david has showed up 
and he's willing to fight him. And so he goes before Saul, and they have this little exchange. And Saul says to him, why do you think you can even take this giant? Have you seen him? Why do you think? And David says, well, king, let me tell you. I was out watching the sheep one day, and this bear came, and he took one of the sheep, started to walk off with him. And what did he do? What does the Bible say? David did what? He killed the bear. He said a lion came in one day and started to take one of the sheep, and again, what did he do? He said, I killed the lion. So if I can care the, kill the bear and the lion... I can certainly take care of this what? This giant. I can certainly take care of this giant. Verse 38. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he was not tested. Now, you know, think about it. I told you that David is just a teenager. Probably 5'8", five, 5'9", five, at the most at this point in his life. And remember, Saul is over what? Seven feet tall. And he, and he gives him his armor. He gives him his shield. And so I, I brought a shield today. And come help me for a second. Come help me for a second. And so, does this feel heavy? Whoa. <laughs> it's heavy, okay? Now, I want you to protect yourself, because I have a, can you hold that up? Kind of? How long can you hold it up for, you think? How comes you're backing away? <laughs> so... I mean, when you think about it, her trying to hold this very long would be what? Sort of impossible. Thank you. You did a great job. And that's how it would have been for David. Nothing would have fit him, you know. You can see the hat coming down over his eyes and him barely being able to hold the shield up. And uh, all of this. And so he said, listen, you thank you, but I'm not going to use this stuff. I'm not going to use it. I'm going to use what God has given to me. And so David, verse 40, 39 says, So David put off, then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Now again, this is a slingshot. It's not like the type that we have today, you know, where you pull it and it goes like that. They had, it was a pocket, it was leather. You'd put a stone in it. Usually had three uh, strings coming out of it, and you would take that, and you would go around your head, and you would let it go. Now, historians tell us that that was a major weapon, and it, those weapons, slingshots, were used in war. Now, you know, when we think of war today, we don't understand biblical war at all. You know, if you Remember back in, I forget, the, the, probably the closest when the movie Braveheart came out. Anybody remember that movie? Watch that movie Braveheart. We saw how the combat was. Or if you've watched any of the things on Netflix, the Vikings, uh, those shows, or I can't think of the other ones. Uh, Throne, um, what's the one? Yeah, okay. Game of Thrones. Those really showed what biblical warfare and how awful it really was and how bloody it really was. And so that's, you know, what we think of when we really think of what was going on here at this battle. But we're told with a slingshot, a man who practiced could hit something 200 yards away, two football fields away. They could hit something and kill it with a slingshot. And so this is what David has. This is what he had used to protect his sheep. And so it says, And the Philistine, in verse 41, moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. 
And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he, was, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And when he says with a stick, it's because probably he had his staff with him, his shepherd's staff and his slingshot was the tools that he had that he was going to use. And it says, And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give you your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the fields. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you, and you ought to underline this, I come to you what? In the name of the Lord Right, the, the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. The day, this day the Lord will deliver you in my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. That's some pretty strong language, isn't it? He's saying, that's some pretty strong language. Listen, you know, you come with these warring things, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord, and today I'm going to cut off your head. Now, that is an amazing statement from this teenager, isn't it? As he faces this giant. But I'll show you why, I think, in a minute, why he could make that statement. And I'll give you the dead body of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds and to the air and to the wild beast and to the earth. Then in all the earth may be known that there is a, and you ought to underline this, there is a God in Israel. And that all the assemblies may know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it into our hands. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly. And I like that. I've circled that in my Bible. He ran. He ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine in his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistines with a sling and with a stone, and struck the Philistines and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistines, took his sword, and drew it out in his sheath, and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that, what did they do? They ran. Now, why wasn't it enough for him just to have the Philistine die? Again, if you understand warfare in that time, you always cut off the head of the king of the other army to take it home back to the land to show your people that you were the victor. And so here's what he did. He cuts off his head, and he has now what? He has a prize. He has a prize, his head. And so what a tremendous story. But what is David's formula for success? God. So take your Bibles, turn to Psalms 25. Again, a writer of the lot of the Psalms is who? David. David. And as you read through the Psalms, you read David's heart. Sometimes his heart is upset with God. Sometimes his heart is depressed. But you see his heart. You see his heart come out. And here in Psalms 25, it says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, O my God, in you I what? In you I trust. In you I trust. So why was it David was able to stand before this giant and said, Listen, by the end of this battle, I'm going to cut off your head. I don't like the fact that you've made fun of our God. I'm going to stand for our God because our God, Yahweh, is the only God. He is the true God, and I have put my faith and my trust in him, and you're going to see that lived out today. That's the reason he had success. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. And you can read it up there. 
I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies, what? Triumph over me. I'm not going to let this giant triumph over me. I, I'm trusting in you, Lord. No one who hopes in you will ever be, what? Put to shame. But shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. And go on to the next slide. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth. And teach me, for you are God my Savior. And my what? Hope is in you. How long? All the day long. All the time. I'm putting my faith and my trust in you. See, David knew that his victory over Goliath was not his own strength. It was because of his humble spirit to trust in God and not in himself. He wasn't trusting in his abilities and his talents. He was trusting in God. Those who put their trust in the Lord have hope. They have hope. They have hope what? First of all, we have hope to see clearly. You know, every one of us in this room are going to go through difficulties in life, aren't we? We are. We're going to go through sometimes financial difficulties. Sometimes we're going to go through physical difficulties. Sometimes we're going to go through emotional difficulties. Sometimes we're going to go through family difficulties. But we're all going to face those. And in the midst of those difficulties, God wants us to see clearly that we can trust in him. That we can trust in him. And in the midst of that, we can act just like David. We can act confidently. We can't control our outcomes in life because there's too many variables. We can't control the outcomes of our life because there's too many variables. So we need to trust in God all the day long. Not our money, not our education, not our position, not our parents, not our job, not in politics. Our trust needs to be in God no matter what we're going through. That's why David acted so confidently, so confidently. I remember the day Al Fitzpatrick walked into my office and said, Pastor, they fired me today. It was a Monday afternoon, and on Friday they told him, unless you sign off on this, Monday morning we will fire you. And we had gotten together as a group of elders, and we had prayed for Al. And he walked in very confidently that day, humbly, but clearly knowing what he needed to do. They put the paperwork in front of him. Again, they were asking him to lie about some financial things to make the, their branch look better. And he said, I'm not going to sign. He said, the president picked up a phone. He said, before I knew it, there were two Delaware State Police there who escorted me to the front door. They took his car keys. They wouldn't even let him take anything from his desk. Took him right to the front door. And his wife was there waiting because they knew what was going to happen. And she picked him up and drove him to the office. But you know... Al had such trust in God. He wasn't trusting in Subaru. He wasn't trusting in that job or his position. His trust was in God, and he saw it clearly. He acted confidently to do what was right that morning, and he walked humbly, and God blessed him. God would end up, it took six months, but God would give him a job outside of Houston, Texas, where believe it or not, he made twice as much money as he was making as the vice president of that office in New Jersey. And so listen, we're going to go through difficulties in life, but we need to put our trust in God. Like David, when our obstacles seem too big that we can overcome, we need to put our trust in God. So some practical steps. Here they are to end with this morning. First of all, know what you believe. David knew what he believed. 
He knew what he believed. And this morning, I would encourage you to listen. Know your Bible. Know that we have a God that's faithful. We have a God that's never going to let you down. We have a God that loves you and cares for you. And he's going to be there for you no matter what you go through. What you believe about God will determine what you believe about life. David believed in God for salvation, for love, for mercy, and forgiveness. Did you hear that? What you believe about God will determine what you believe about life. Next, accept his word as truth. This is truth right here. This is the only truth that there is today. Believe it. Live it. Read it. Memorize it. Make it part of your life. Live it out. Accept his word as truth. David loved the law. David allowed the law to break him. He let God be king of his heart. Even in his failures, even in David's horrible failures, we're going to find out as we go through this series that David trusted God. And he would come humbly before God when he blew it, as we'll see. And then, maintain a big view of God. David saw God as bigger than Goliath. Often we see our problems bigger than God, don't we? That's the reason that we only see our problems and we don't see God who is much bigger than our problems. See, a small view of God has the attitude, I'm in control of my life, I have my plan, I have my hope, I hope that God approves it. When we have a big view of God, we can live certainly knowing we can take risk like David because it's not about us, it's about God. It's a pretty big risk that David took, wasn't it? Why? Because he had a big view of God. And then lastly, let passion move you. Let passion move you. Listen, we ought to be excited about living the Christian life. Sometimes we're just dead, aren't we? But David had a passion. He didn't go out there and say, well, Goliath, I think I'm going to beat you today. I certainly hope I am. No, he had passion. He said, I come to you in the name of God, and I'm going to cut off your head. Is that passion? It is. And we ought to have passion about living the Christian life. We ought to have passion about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people, whether it's in the store or whether it's in the, um, at, at the restaurants, no matter if it's at work, with our neighbors. I had a neighbor. Her name is Carol. If I want to know anything about what's going on in the neighborhood, I go to Carol. She can tell everything. She came to me yesterday. I don't know how she knew. She said, now, is this your wife's week for surgery? Now, I have told no. I know. I don't know how she knows, honey. Sometimes I think she has, like, ways to listen in our homes. But she said, this is your wife's week for surgery. And I said, yeah. And uh, she said, how are you feeling about that? And I said, I have real peace about it, and I know that... God's going to take care of us. And she said, well, that's a pretty bold statement. And she said, why did, again, why do you believe God's going to take care of this? So I sort of gave her the gospel. And that would be like the third time I've shared the gospel with Carol. But you know what? Listen, we need to have passion. I know that God's going to be with Virginia in surgery this week. I know he's going to take care of that. And so, listen, we need to have passion about living the Christian life. Are you excited about living for God? No, you're not. <laughs> Come on. Are you excited about living for God? Act of what? Can we get a good amen? Are you excited about living for God? Yeah. Amen. Well, then let's go out this week and let's live for God. Let's go out this week and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's go out this week and tell our neighbors that there's someone who loves them and died on the cross for their sin and that they can spend eternity in heaven. Let's have passion 
for living the Christian life because we have an awesome and a great and a mighty God who's there for us. David put his trust in God and he lived like it. Let's live like we put our trust in God and not in ourselves. Let's pray. Father, thank you for David and thank you for this story of his life this morning. Or if we grew up in a church, we've heard this story forever. Since we were kids, Lord, we've heard the story of David and Goliath. But the key is in Psalms 25, where David put his trust in God. Not in himself, not in his slingshot. Though he was skilled, he knew. He knew when he told that giant, listen, today I'm going to cut off your head. He knew it was God who was going to give him that victory. So Lord, no matter what we face, whether it's health, whether it's a, a, a emotional struggles, whether it's heartache in our family, Father, whether it's heartache at our job, no matter what it is, Lord, help us this morning to know that we can trust in a God who's much bigger than us. We can trust in a God who loves us, who cares for us, who gives us mercy fresh and new every day. Lord, help us to be excited. Help us to have passion about living for Jesus and putting our trust in God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I feel like I've been stirred up a bit, Pastor. I think we all need to be stirred, you know, within our spirit. We need to be trusting him. We need to be asking God, what do you want me to do? How can I serve you, Lord? I've been stirred up, Pastor, and I hope that others here too. Let's rise and sing our closing song, God Will Make a Way. Let's pray. Father, make a way for us to serve you this week. Thank you for the challenge we've heard today. Thank you for the strength you give us. Thank you for the confidence you've bestowed in each of us. And now, Father, may we go out from this place and may we live 
like we have confidence in a God that is worth having confidence in. For you and you alone will make all things possible. Thank you for using us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.